بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد على أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين My dear brothers and sisters, السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته I want to begin by congratulating you on the births of our beloved Imam Hussein, Imam al-Sajjad alayhim as-salam, and Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas. And may these days, the days of Sha'ban, be a blessing and a reward for you. And may Allah keep you safe always. I wanted to begin tonight, and I'm sure you share this sentiment with, with me, um, by thanking all of the doctors, the nurses, the uh, people working in the hospitals, on the front lines of this crisis, they are sacrificing so much. They are putting their own well-being um, at risk. And they are engaging in service to humanity at the broadest of scales. So as a human being, as a Muslim, as a believer in God, I thank them, I laud them for their efforts, and I am humbled by what they are doing for all of us. With that, I'm sure you share in that gratitude. And if you get the opportunity, thank your doctor, your nurse, your healthcare provider, the public health officials, and all those people who are striving hard to keep us safe and to prevent the spread of this disease and this crisis. Today was a nice day, alhamdulillah. I don't know about you, but I was out in the sun. It was a balmy 85 degrees here in North Carolina. And I was out in my yard, and I, I don't like to admit it, but my yard had really been sorely neglected. In fact, the, the weeds were up to my knees. And so um, I spent the entire day in the sun and enjoyed that day and got some work done that really needed to be done for, for quite a while. And if it hadn't been for these circumstances, it probably wouldn't have gotten done. So Alhamdulillah, the sun, the blessing of Allah is all around us. Maybe we need to open our hearts to feel it inside ourselves. I want to begin tonight in this celebration, in this moment, and hopefully as your brother in Islam, your brother, your fellow human being, ask the question that in our lives, why is it that we act in certain ways? What makes us do certain things? And in a given circumstance or a given situation, how would I act if the situation had changed slightly or if there was something different? What drove me to do the things that I uh, do. So for example, let's say um, I was going to the supermarket um, because I wanted, let's change the example actually. Let's say I was going to this fancy French bakery um, and that's uh, in my city and I wanted to get a bit out of my love as a father for her to get her this beautiful cake, cake, this delicious cake and to make her happy. And so as I was going out, the only thing, imagine, imagine the example, the only thing I had in my pocket was a $10 bill. Now, as I was going forward, um, I walked uh, to the cake store and I went straight into the store. There was a cake for $9. I gave the, um, the person at the, at the counter my $10 bill, obviously keeping six feet of distance away from them and observing the rules and the recommendations of the health officials. And I got the cake and I went home. And I brought the cake to my daughter and very deservingly, I gave it to her and she was happy. And she, being the generous child that she is, she shared it with me and with her mother and with her brother. And we all actually enjoyed it. Now, let's say the circumstances changed a little bit. And I actually went towards the cake shop, this really nice French cake shop with the $10 in my pocket. And as I was walking, I saw a poor man, some poor person sitting on the side of the road clearly destitute, clearly hungry, clearly suffering in the state that he or she was in. And as I was going forward, I saw them and I, I, I stopped for a second because I saw their state and I visualized what they were going through. I suddenly paused and I thought to myself, wow, a piece of cake from a French bakery. I earned that $10 in a halal manner, in an acceptable manner. God has given to me. I am very grateful for that. And for me to go out and buy a piece of cake, for $9 or however much it was, which is quite expensive for a piece of cake, if you think about it, um, is reasonable. It's allowed. I'm not doing something haram. But now seeing the poor man on the side of the road, I thought to myself, do I need to spend $9 on buying that piece of cake after looking at the poor man? And thought to myself, 
maybe I should just go to my local grocery store rather than to the fancy French bakery and get just a regular piece of cake for $3 or $4 and then give the remaining money, the remainder of that $10 to the poor man. Now, in these two circumstances, in the first option, when there was no poor person in my path or on the way to the French bakery, the question I should ask myself is would I have thought about a poor person or the needs of a destitute human being who is suffering, who doesn't have anything, if I didn't actually see them sitting on the side of the road? Would I have been conscious of the fact that there is a needy human being somewhere? I hate to say it, but the answer is probably no. That I would have gone into the French bakery, heedless to the world, bought my $9 piece of cake and come home and enjoyed it with my daughter and my wife and my son and had a great time. It was only because it was in front of my face that something woke inside of me. And the question I wanted to ask myself, why is that the case? Why isn't it that it was always awake inside of me? Whether I saw the poor person standing there, sitting there, putting his hand out, asking for help or not. And that is something that I would like us to consider tonight as we sit and we think about imamat and the place of imamat and the circumstances that surround our lives and dictate why we do what we do. We indeed need to be introspective. We need to think about what we are doing. We need to ask ourselves what drives us in a certain way. They say um, one day, Omar ibn Abdul Aziz, one of the um, Umawi Khalifas came to Medina. He left Damascus and he left his headquarters and he came to Medina. In Medina, he stayed for some time and they say that the people wanted to visit with him and they wanted to bring the complaints of Medina to him and the, the acts of his governor that were taking place that were inadequate, that were unjust and inequitable. Al-Imam al-Baqir alayhi salatu was salam, they say he went to visit Omar ibn Abdul Aziz to bring to light some of the injustices that were taking place, some of the things that were happening under the rule of this individual that he needed to become aware of and that needed to be corrected. They say Imam comes in, Imam Baqir alayhi salam comes into the presence of Omar ibn Abdul Aziz. It is reported that there were some tears in his eyes. And when there were tears inside in his eyes, they say Imam al Baqir alayhi salatu was salam asked, What has troubled you? What is making you weep like this or tear up like this? the attendant who was standing to the side of Omar ibn Abdul Aziz, he says there are things, some things that are perplexing him, that are making him feel down. They say Imam al-Baqir alayhi salatu was salam, he looked at the man and he looked at Omar ibn Abdul Aziz and he says, inna dunya suq min al-aswaq. He says this life, the life of this world, is a shop in the grand marketplace. It is like a shop in the marketplace. He says there are some people who come to the shop in the life of this world, they take from that shop and unfortunately they are harmed by what they take. It has a negative effect on them. They experience loss because of what they have taken from that shop. He says there are, Imam Bakr explains, there are other people who come and they take from the shop, from the life of this world. And indeed they take intelligently with reasoning and consideration and they benefit from the things that they have taken. Imam Baqar, he says, there is a third group of people who they come to the shop, who are in the life of this world. And he says, they live a life and they face the sort of suffering and the sort of trials that we face, the Ahl al-Bayt, the likes of which the Ahl al-Bayt has faced. They face great sort of persecution and suffering and, tire and sort of tyranny on top of their heads and deprivation in certain ways. He says, unfortunately, these people get to death. And when they are at death, they find that they did not even benefit from what was available in that shop, in the hayat, the dunya, despite the fact that they were suffering and had such a difficult life, suggesting again that even in the most difficult circumstances, that there is something that we can benefit from. Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam tells Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, it is related, that there is a fourth group of people who they basically hoard and they take all the inheritance of the world. Anything that's left behind by anybody, they grab a hold of it and they take it and they do so without being grateful for the fact that they have received it. And worse off, they are negligent and they are heedless of the fact that to God we all have to return and that we all have to answer. They say the attendant and Umar ibn Abdul Aziz are listening to Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam and they want help. They say, help us, 
ibn Rasulullah. Um, Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam, now again, keeping into consideration that the Banu Umayyah were the enemies of the Ahl al-Bayt, they had tyrannized. Now, even maybe they recognize the fact that all the knowledge was with al-Imam al-Baqir. Al-Imam al-Baqir alayhi salatu was salam, he advises now Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. He says to him, be advised that ensure that you are not engaged in wicked activities, activities that harm others, that are evil. Engage only in goodness. Open your door so that people can come and speak to you and that you can rectify the negligence of your governor and what you have instituted in your plans as a leader. Al-Imam al-Baqir alayhi salatu was salam. He says, a, per a person, any person, any believer, will never reach perfection in belief in God, will never reach the perfection of Iman except if they have three qualities inside of them. They ask ya Imam al-Baqir, what are these three qualities? Al-Imam al-Baqir alayhi salatu was salam, he says, if you find yourself, the first quality is that if you find yourself to be satisfied, pleased that God has given you what you wanted, that your desires have been met, that your wants have been fulfilled, if you find yourself to be sa'ala, don't allow it to be a doorway to wrongful deeds. Number two, Al-Imam Al-Baqir alayhi salatu was salam, he says, if you find that um, you have been angered by something, that you become angry, do not allow your anger or in that state of anger that you take the rights of somebody else, that you trample on the rights of another human being. My dear brothers and sisters, Al-Imam Al-Baqir is instructing us, and this is the legacy of Imamat. Number three, Al-Imam Al-Baqir alayhi salatu was salam, after stating the first two points that if you are satisfied and happy and content in life do not allow it to be a doorway to transgression and wrongful act and number two if you become angry do not allow your anger to cause you to violate the rights of people number three al-imam al-baqir alayhi salatu was salam he says if you happen to have power if you come to be in a position of power do not allow it to make you such that you devour what is in the hands of other people do not usurp what is in the hands of other people. Now, brothers and sisters, that power may not be necessarily the power of leadership or kingship or governorship. It could be a personal power in the house uh, of a family where the father has a certain power or the mother has a certain power over the children or the children have over each other or one companion who has over another. There could be personal relationships in which one person may dominate another. And Al-Imam Al-Baqir alayhi salatu was salam he says, don't devour what the other person has. Don't take it away just because you have a position of power. These are the guidances of Imamat. And we see that Imamat is the timeless example for us. Why? Because they lived in different situations. From the very start, from the demise of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam and the Imamat of Al-Imam Ali alayhi salatu wa salam, all the way through the 10 Imams that came after and the 12th Imam who then went into occultation, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon all of them. You see that they lived in different circumstances. And what is to marvel about them and the reason why they are a timeless example for us, why we always recount what they lived through, what they did, how they acted, the words that they said, is that their motivations were amazing. You see that they achieved such great things whether it is the feats of Al-Imam Ali alayhi salatu was salam in the battles in the defense of Islam, in the defense of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, bringing down the fortress of Khaybah, etc. All of these things, whether it is the patience and the strength of Al-Imam Al-Hasan or the self-sacrifice of Al-Imam al Hussein alayhi salatu was salam or the worshipfulness of Imam Al-Sajjad in the face of uh, such pain and suffering and great loss or any of the great feats, you marvel because these Imams had the greatest of motivation. Something motivated them. Something caused them to be motivated. My dear brothers and sisters, we are motivated by things that are inside of us. And indeed, many of us, when we are sincere, we can achieve great things because our motivation is driven by something pure, something godly, something innately connected to Allah. However, the problem is we are shaped by the world around us. We are moved and swayed in the directions that the forces blow in this world. 
And indeed, that is how human beings are. Allah has made us that way. But that's also why Allah has given us this anchored example of imamat from the first to the last. In every circumstance, a beacon of what to do and what not to do. So why is it that we are motivated? What motivates us? And there are some studies, there is some data that recognizes the fact that motivation, a person's personal motivation, is a greater indication of their success when you compare it to, the, let's say, their ability or their intelligence. So in fact, if a person is really, really motivated, it doesn't matter as much how intelligent necessarily they are or how much capability or ability they have, their motivation will drive them towards success. So why is it that motivation is such a driver for us? There has to be something behind it, pushing us like a piece of cake in a cafe, like the happiness of our children, like excelling in our careers. My dear brothers and sisters, the basic human nature is to look for a reward. You will see that this is human nature, a, um, a, uh, basically a separation or a disparity or a dichotomy between what causes us pleasure versus what causes us pain. And we are always looking for that reward. Human beings are driven by reward. Yet science even shows and sociological studies even show that the problem with reward is that if you pull the reward away from someone, their motivation goes down. It is very easy to logically understand that if a person is rewarded with something and given the option of getting a reward, their motivation will be high. The greater the reward, the greater the motivation. Yet the problem is the minute you pull the reward away, their motivation will go away or their motivation will diminish. In this way, there has to be something beyond that reward. There must be something that causes human beings to excel to such a high degree that whether you give them or don't give them, whether there is a reward or no reward, that they will excel. My dear brothers and sisters, this is imamat. This is the beautiful position of imamat. And that's why Imam al Hussein alayhi salatu was salam, he says, Aradayt ya Rabb, khud ilayka hatta tarda. I want only your pleasure, ya Allah. Are you satisfied with what I have given for you, for your love, Ya Allah? Take from me everything, Ya Allah, and be satisfied with me. Your Jannah is not what I seek necessarily. Your uh, Naar is not what I am afraid of necessarily. I want your love, Ya Allah. I want to be close to you and I want your pleasure, Ya Allah. So my dear brothers and sisters, rewards can be a great source of motivation for us. On the other hand, we sometimes are motivated by feelings. Many a times our feelings drive how we behave. We uh, are allowed uh, to pursue things because of our great zeal, but sometimes that zeal comes from a place of revenge, God forbid, or anger, or a desire to see somebody else suffer, or because um, there is some vendetta that we have that is personal to us. My dear brothers and sisters, the A'im al athar were so great in every way. Why? Because they never looked for anything on a personal level. There was no gain for them on a personal level. When Imam al-Rida alayhi salatu was salam was brought up to Persia and Ma'mun al-Abbas, he kept trying to cajole him and force him to become his deputy to take over the position of Khilafah after him. Imam Rida alayhi salam said, I don't want it. I am not looking for this worldly recognition. And he was echoing the words of his forefathers, the words of Imam Ali alayhi salatu was salam, that this worldly recognition is not something that we want. We want only to serve in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you see that emotion, feeling, personal drive for some personal goal that fulfills a basic need inside of us, a basic whim inside of us, also is a faulty motivator. Why? Because it reflects only a personal aspect and not a broader aspect, not a benefit to humanity, only what seemingly is good for me in my life and what is beneficial to me. My dear brothers and sisters, we are living in this life uh, influenced by everything around us. Why? Because it is the nature of the world. And you see that the world has changed. The world in the beginning, in the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, and prior to that, even many hundreds of years before that, was very agrarian. People would um, plant farms and they would trade in their produce and they had animals and they dealt in those very things. 
And then as the world expanded, people traded to Arabia, people traded to Europe. Now you begin to see that the forces of humanity begin to move and the ways of people begin to transfer from one place to another. You see this even in Islam, the Islamic way, you see that what started in Hijaz, what started in Mecca, moved to Medina, and then after Rasulullah left this world, began to spread throughout the world in various different fashions, sometimes unfortunately with the sword, and was against the way of Islam to spread Islam or the religion by the sword or by compulsion in any way. They say that it spread and unfortunately it took on aspects of different cultures and different regions and the ways of people that then began to influence the minds of Muslims. You, we see that today. Our minds, wherever we live, are influenced by what is around us and what affects us. And we see that to be anchored, we must look for the certain qualities that God has considered to be lofty. Now, everyone wants to be um, respectful, compassionate, um, honest. And all of these qualities are laudable in a society. And in society, we can say that if I live in a secular society, as long as I am a respectful, law-abiding citizen, why is that not enough? Indeed, it is good and it is necessary. And it is stated by Islam that we should be law-abiding. We should be helpful in our uh, countries and our places of residences, particularly in times like this, my dear brothers and sisters. Help everybody you can, not just Muslims. Help anybody who is in need in this difficult time because it is the Islamic way to help anyone. Yet, is it enough to say that in this society, I just follow the flow of the society in the way society is doing and forget what it is that I am at my core? Imamat reminds us of that. It reminds us that at the core, we need to be something that will not change with the flow of society because today's society will not be the same society in a hundred years. In our own country, red states and blue states differ on philosophies of life on what it means to be a family, on what it means to do certain things scientifically, etc. So things change, and yet the anchors of life that God has placed, they don't change. And they make for us a roadmap for our own success. Let me give you a story. Imam al-Sajjad, alayhi salam, he faced and he lived through one of the worst ordeals in Karbala, he saw the martyrdom of his father, his beloved father. He saw how badly his relatives were treated, the, the ladies of the Ahl al-Bayt, He saw the killing of his brothers and his cousins and his uncles and the companions of his father. And they say that after the ordeal in Kufa and in Sham in Damascus, he returned to Medina. And if anyone had a right to pick up a sword and fight and seek justice, and seek writing what was wrong, what was taken away from the family of the Prophet ﷺ, it was his right. It was his uh, uh, definite uh, right to do so. Yet you see that he engages in a life of worship. He engages in a life where even though the surroundings are changing, Mukhtar al-Thaqafi is going out to seek justice for what has happened in Karbala. Yet Imam Hussein, uh, Imam al-Sajjad remains. Imam Sajjad's son goes out and rises up against tyranny. Yes, yet Imam Sajjad remains. He stays where he is. Why did he not flow with what was happening with others? Why did Imam Sajjad not just go with what everyone else was doing? He had more right to seek the wrong, to seek justice for the wrongs that were done in Karbala. They say he would go on foot to Hajj over and over again. He would walk to Mecca from Medina. And those of you who have gone for Hajj and those who have gone for Umrah know that that distance between Medina and Mecca is not short. It is not an easy one. And imagine it hundreds of years ago where there were no paved roads. He would walk on foot and go. They say one day he was walking towards Mecca to go for Hajj. And as he is going for Hajj, a man stops him. It is related that the man comes to him and he says, Yabna Rasulillah, O grandson of the Prophet. Have you left off your jihad, your fight, your struggle for justice, as he says it? And have you left off jihad and sought instead to just go for hajj repeatedly? And have you not read the Quran or the ayah of the Quran 
and the man quoted the ayah saying in Allah ishtara min al mu'minin anfusahum wa amwalahum bi anna lahum al jannah yuqatiluna fi sabil Allah fa yaqtuluna wa yuqtalun have you not read the ayah this man says to imam sajjad that Allah has purchased has taken from the believers their nafs their self and their wealth and in return he has given them jannah he has given them paradise they go out in defense of islam they vanquish their enemy they themselves are martyred and allah is the one who gives them why is it that you have forsaken jihad and that struggle and instead you seek to go on hajj al imam al sajjad alayhi salatu was salam he says recite the very next ayah after this the man is surprised the very next ayah then is recited it says التائبون العابدون الحامدون السائحون الراكعون الساجدون الآمرون بالمعروف والناهون عن المنكر والحافظون لحدود الله وبشر المؤمنين. The very next ayah after the one that was just quoted by this individual to the imam, it says the penitent ones, the worshipful ones, the praise one, praiseworthy ones, the ones who praise God, the ones who are bowing constantly. The ones who are constantly in sajda and prostration, the ones who always uphold what is right and deny and push against what is evil and what is wrong, and those people who preserve the limits of God and may God's new good news be on the believers. Imam Al Sajjad he says to the man, he says, if I had found these people truly, the the people who fit this category and this description, he said jihad would have definitely been better than going for Hajj. Clearly, Imam did not find those people who were penitent, who were worshipful, who praised God constantly, who bowed constantly. Now, brothers and sisters, I ask you that is it truly that there were not any of those people in the world? This the Muslim world had spread, had spread into Europe, spread into Asia, spread into Africa by then. Were there not people who were praising God, reading the Quran? Were there not people who were saying Astaghfirullah Rabbi wa Atubu ilay, being penitent? Were there not people doing Amar bil ma'roof wa nahi an al munkar? Then why is it that Al Imam al Sajjad says that if there were people that we had found who had these qualities, surely that fighting against the tyranny and doing jihad would have been better than going for Hajj? Maybe, my dear brothers and sisters, because even in doing those things, in practicing worship, in remembering God, in uh, bowing and prostrating, and Amar bil ma'roof nahi an al munkar, they had lost the very anchor the very essence and the meaningfulness of what that meant. And so those dry acts maybe did not have the effects that they needed to have, that those acts were maybe just superficial. I'm not saying everybody, but the point of the Imam is that there is something deeper to be considered, that we spend a life of worship, we spend a life in which we are constantly striving to get to God. And yet maybe at times we don't realize the forces around us the forces that are moving us. And so you see that this Imam of ours, and in fact, every Imam, my dear brothers and sisters, particularly our youth, look at the beauty of Imamat, that after Karbala, how many of our Imams picked up a sword to fight, to defend what had been taken from them or, or right the wrongs that had been done to the family of the Prophet. And the wrongs were so, uh, so severe. Just read the stories of a man like Humayd ibn Qahtaba, who had uh, done such heinous crimes, or Al-Hajjaj ibn Yusuf al-Thaqafi, who was one of the cruelest men, particularly to the Ahl al-Bayt. Yet none of our Imams picked up a sword. All of them engaged in doing something important, deepening those qualities that I just recited to you from Surah at tawbah the penitence, the worshipfulness, the praise of God, the bowing, the prostration, they sought to ingrain them and anchor them in their followers as the essence of who they are. That is imamat. Imamat is the very ingraining of these qualities inside of us, not just as superficial traits that we practice on a day-to-day -day basis as a habit, but as a way of life, as a form of our identity, my dear brothers and sisters. And you see that insan is constantly shaking because of where we are and how we live. And we find that if we were to hold on and preserve these qualities and remind ourselves of them, that we would be able to hold on to the path of imamat in the way that we should. 
see in a beautiful example that the two different uh, sides of this story of what happened, that when Imam al Hussein alayhi salatu was salam was making his way up to Karbala, he stopped in a place and there was some tents nearby. Imam Hussein called one of the men, one of his companions or his attendant, and he said, go call the person who is inside that tent. The man went and invited the Kufan who was inside the tent. He was a man from Kufa. His, ma his name was Ubaidullah ibn, ibn Hurra Jafi. Ubaidullah Jafi was in the tent when the attendant invited him saying that Imam Hussein is calling you. He said, no, I don't want to come tell your master. I don't want to see him. When the message came back to Imam Hussein, Imam Hussein got up himself and went to see this man. When he announced himself and entered into the tent, they say, Ubaidullah ibn Hurra Jafi. He saw Imam. They bid salam to each other. Imam Hussein, he says to him that join us. He knew he was from Kufa. He had just left Kufa. And you know the circumstances in Kufa in those days had become difficult because of Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad and his taking over and his tyranny in Kufa, but also due to the immediate turning of the people of Kufa away from Imam Hussein. This man left Kufa, fled away from Kufa. So Imam Hussein said to him, come join us and we will give you success, not only in this world, but more importantly, success in the next world. We will guarantee that for you. Forgiveness for your sins. It is reported that this man, Ubaidullah, he says, I don't want uh, anything that you are going to give to me. He says, if I thought that what you were going to do was going to be successful or had a chance, and I am paraphrasing as it was reported, this man, he says to Imam Hussein, he says, if I thought that what you are going to do or where you are going or where you are headed to is going to end in success or something positive, I would be the first person to join you. Now look, he had added a condition onto his faith, a condition onto following the Imam. He says, instead, O Hussein, let me give you some advice. I have a horse in my stable. It is the fastest horse, take it and run away from here far. Now look at this man and now look at Imam Hussein. Imam Hussein listens to this man's so-called advice. He says to him, now, do you permit me to tell you something? The man, he says, yes. The man listens as Imam Hussein tells him very pointedly that listen to my words. You should take your horse and everything you have and ride as far away from here as possible. Because if we call for help, we call for support, for people to stand with us against tyranny in the name of God, in the name of religion of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, and you don't answer that call, you will fall into the deepest pits of hell, saying this Imam Hussein leaves. And Ubaidullah departs and does not join Imam Hussein. On the other hand, Imam Hussein comes upon another tent where a man is to, acts in the same manner. He doesn't want to see Imam Hussein initially, but he has been traveling with Imam parallel to Imam Hussein's caravan. He stops. Imam Hussein asks him to come. He says, I don't want to come. Finally, Imam Hussein himself goes again and he sits down and he says, join us. They say that Zuhair ibn al-Qayn gets up. He says to his wife, my path is with Hussein. Go, you are free. <laughs> he joins Imam Hussein. What is it that made him choose that and Ubaidullah ibn Hurra Jafi go the other way? Because there is something. The tides, the flows of society, the machinations of the leaders, people's tendencies are there. The Kufans were two-faced. They had turned away from Imam Hussein. The people of the Hijaz had heard that Imam Hussein, people were joining Imam Hussein, leaving Imam Hussein. Yet one joined and the other didn't. The one who joined, like Zuhair ibn al Qain, like a few others, like Hur ibn Yazid al-Riyahi on the day of Ashura, these were people who were not subject to the flows of society around them, to the sentiments of people around them, to the forces that were directing the minds of others. No, these people were free. They knew the essence of what they had to believe and they knew immediately what they had to do. My dear brothers and sisters, this is what we have to live like in our lives. And Imam Hussein alayhi salam, we know teaches us, imamat in general teaches us, that in any time, in any time, there is a personal responsibility upon us 
We must never think that there is no responsibility on us in the way of God. We must never think that I don't know enough or that because I don't wear a turban on my head, I can't benefit someone else. No, you can always benefit someone. You can always share your goodness with somebody else. That is the legacy of Imam. That no matter what, there is a feeling of personal responsibility. That no matter what anyone does, Imamat shows that the believer, the one who follows that Imamat, always feels personally responsible and acts by the verse of the Quran that says, You will not achieve goodness for yourselves unless and until you sacrifice what you love the most in your own self. What you want for your own self, you sacrifice it for others. This is the legacy of Imamat, that to feel that personal responsibility. My dear brothers and sisters, Imamat from start to finish taught us to answer the call of God. That means in any circumstance, that means me walking to that cake shop and seeing that poor man. And maybe not even seeing that poor man, but while walking to that cake shop and not seeing anybody needy or not feeling the needs of anybody, have a feeling of conscience, have a feeling of maybe, dare I say, a little bit of guilt and a little bit of um, compassion for those who don't have. A feeling that if I am eating this, then let me make sure that somebody else is also getting something from my pocket to benefit from. This was the way of the Ahl al-Bayt. This was the way from start to finish, from Al-Imam Ali alayhi salatu was salam to Al-Imam al-Hujjah ajjalallahu ta'ala farajahu sharif And indeed, there is no way that they got this anywhere other than from the Habib sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, from our Holy Prophet. Our Holy Prophet was the beacon, the nur, by which all of these beautiful qualities passed into Imamat because they became the legacy and the stamp that reminded everyone we must give of ourselves and feel personal responsibility. We must answer the call of God. Like the ayah, it says, Ya ladina aman stajibu lillahi wa rasuli idha da'akum lima yuhyikum wa'alamu anna allaha yahulu bayna al-mar'i wa qalbih O you who believe, answer the call of God and the call of Rasulullah. What is the call of God? It is, yes, indeed, to worship him as one. But it is also to feel a responsibility to our own selves, to who we are, how we behave, and to share and to give and to feel that the needs of another person are upon my shoulders. That if someone is still hungry, it's because I didn't do what I was supposed to do. My dear brothers and sisters, we must fight anything that creates doubt in our minds and remove it. We must remove anything that drives us from a place of our base desires. Those base desires are what corrupt the world and move societies in the wrong direction. Today, wealth dominates everything. Globalization has changed the world. The pursuit of money, the pursuit of worldly gain trumps human rights. Trump, Trump's justice, Trump's equity. And yet, that's why you saw that the Ahl al-Bayt, A'imma al-Athar alayhim as salam were the simplest of the most simple. They were the people who had denounced the world. Why? Because those things had no meaning to them. That instead, they wanted to share and give. Imam Hussein alayhi salam provides us with a very valuable warning in his life. It is reported that he said, وَمَا سُلِبْتُمْ ذَلِكَ إِلَّا بِتَفَرُّقِكُمْ عَنِ الْحَقِّ وَاخْتِلَافِكُمْ فِي السُنَّةِ بَعْدَ الْبَيِّنَةِ الْوَاضِحَةِ He says the reason you have come to find yourselves in such a difficult state, in a state where you are struggling, in a state, and I am paraphrasing, bear with me dear brothers and sisters, I cannot capture the words of Imam Hussein with my limited tongue. He says you are in this state, this difficult state, because you have moved away and separated yourself from the truth. And because you have gone against the sunnah, the way that was established for you in a clear and evident manner. Now he says, وَلَوْ صَبَرْتُمْ عَلَى الْأَذَى وَتَحَمَّلْتُمْ الْمَأُونَةَ فِي ذَاتِ اللَّهِ كَانَتْ أُمُورَ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكُمْ تَرِدُوا وَعَنْكُمْ تَصْدُرْ وَإِلَيْكُمْ تَرْجَعُ He says, if you had just been patient, if you were just patient a little bit, 
in the way of God, if you had just bared a little bit the other, the, the un discomfort, the pain that was coming upon you, rather than capitulating, rather than compromising, if you were just patient, all the affairs of God would have come to you. They would have been to your benefit. They would have rested with you and you would have been the source of anything that came thereof. And they, you would have been the beneficiary of the good and the positivity. Imam Hussein, he says, instead, you wrongly placed all of the affairs in the hands of the oppressors. These are not the ruling oppressors necessarily. This is putting anything in the wrong place as that is what is dhulm. Al-wadhu shay' fi ghayr makanihi. Putting anything in the wrong place is an injustice. And when Imam Hussein he says you took what was rightfully in the place of the guides chosen by Allah and you placed them in the hands of the oppressors and you moved it out of its position and you handed the affairs of God in their hands and you placed the affairs and the tenets of your religion in their hands and what happened they acted on suspicious things they did not act on the firm tenets of religion they acted on doubt and suspicion and they were walking the path of their base whims and desires religion didn't dictate god didn't dictate whims greed and the feeding of the physical lust is what dictated their life now listen to the last part my dear brothers brothers and sisters imam hussein alayhi salam he says salatahum ala dhalika firarukum min al -maut. the reason these injustices were happening and the power was given to the unjust to the tyrants to do this was because you were afraid of death because you were running away from death so you capitulated and you handed the affairs into the hands of the unjust and the inequitable you were so enamored by the life of this world that you wanted just anything to stay here and you compromised whatever you had to compromise so that you ensured your position here such that maybe you thought death was never going to get to you. If anything, Imamat shows us that death comes at any moment and that we as individuals must aspire to the qualities that Imamat had. Just like we pass on the good things of our culture, our language, our nationality to our children, let us pass on the very essence of our religion that is Imamat to our children. Because their example is the example that applies in any time. It applies in any moment. Imam Hussein is as relevant today as he was 1400 years ago. The worship of as sajjad alayhi salam is relevant today as it was 1400 years ago. Its application, the patience of al-Imam al kadhim the wisdom of al-Imam al-Sadiq, al-Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam the, uh, the, the forbearance of al-Imam al-Radha alayhi salam and all of our imma's great acts, our, their acts of valor, and the context in which you see them shine. That is the key. The context in the social circumstances, the tyranny, the people around them, the forces flowing in every direction around them, and how they behaved. It bears an examination, my dear brothers and sisters. And it warrants us to see how does it apply to my life. Why is it that that Imam who did that thing in that moment hundreds of years ago is relevant today? And I assure you that if you search and if you look at the wisdom behind their action and the motivation of why they did what they did, you will find the very essence of it is the same today as it was then. And it will remain the same essence until the end of time. That's why Imamat is that anchor, that timeless anchor that will never change. I pray to Allah that we hold on to the rope of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad alayhim salatu wa salam and that we seek from Allah that which he knows is best for us and that he gives us patience and strength and that we smile at each other in these days. I miss being able to sit in your company in the mosques. It is very strange looking at a camera and speaking as if I'm speaking to somebody on the other end. But I wish you all well. I hope you are safe and protected. Pray for me and I will pray for you. And until the next time, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.